Um, I will also share with you guys that the Zoom has updated some features. If it, if it hasn't hit you up to um, update your Zoom in a little bit, um, it might be worth it because they finally made it so we can do breakout rooms where you guys pick your breakout room so that it makes it really easy to work in small groups. Um, so for labs and stuff, if uh, before lab starts today, um, if you guys um, try and uh, update your Zoom, which you can get to from, if you're looking at, if you have Zoom installed, if you're looking at the main page here, if you just click on your um, profile pick up in the corner and then there's a button for check for updates. Um, and, uh, but I've, we've found out that people that haven't updated to the latest version of Zoom, when I try to do the breakout rooms where everybody picks their own, just nothing shows up for you. Um, so we can give that a try later today, if you like. Um, although with a class of 10 people, everybody sitting in lab together, it doesn't seem as, as intimidating as when there's 40 people in there, right? So um, maybe matters a little bit less for you guys. Um, and I did not update that outline at all. So the only thing that's still relevant here is quiz questions. We'll talk about quiz questions and then um, we'll get into more complicated alkane nomenclature. Um, I missed that there was an isopropyl group on the, on the quiz. So I tried not to be, if you, if you tried to put something along those lines or indicate that it was a propyl group, um, you had got credit on that one. Um, and then, um, but we'll, we'll talk about how to name those more complicated alkanes and then we'll start getting into what, is, what if there are other things attached and some of the um, properties that alkanes can have. Uh, random questions. What's my favorite and least favorite thing about chemistry? Um, I normally really like the fact that chemistry is really, really complicated because uh, you can study like anything if you understand how, how interconnected everything is. However, last night when I was trying to get you guys data ready to go for your lab today, um, and I would, had been working at it for like four hours in Excel trying to get uh, the data to look the right way, um, that was not my favorite thing about chemistry, how complicated it can be. Um, so best and worst thing about chemistry is how complicated it is. Um, somebody asked about uh, what planets you think we as humans would be able to adapt to. And I'm going to take this chance. To, I, I know I've, um, I've pitched this uh, author to some of you before, Kim Stanley Robinson, the guy who, read, who wrote uh, Red Mars. Um, he also has a book. I think it's called, I'm going to mix up the numbers. It's 2312. I think it's just the name of the book that actually describes what technology and genetic modification might look like to make humans able to live on different planets and moons in the solar system. Um, it has some really cool ideas from a, um, a city on Mercury that's on rails. Um, and the rails, when they get, when they're on the hot side of the sun, expand to the point where they actually keep the city propelled forward just by the expansion of the rails. And then as they cool down on the dark side of Mercury, they contract. So your whole city basically slides on a railway system um, around and stays on the dark side of the moon or dark side of the Mercury. Um, also, you know, talks about the uh, logistics of terraforming Mars versus Venus and how they would be different and stuff like that. Um, so super, super cool um, ideas. It's sort of a, uh, um, a more sci-fi version of, um, I'm trying to think of what the name of the Carl Sagan book was where he talked about the entire solar system and what the prospects were for colonizing different things, but he was, it's Carl Sagan. So it was a lot more grounded in current technology and this is a lot more sci-fi, um, but super interesting uh, for me, at least if you're interested in sci-fi or talking about planet planets being colonized, I highly recommend anything that that guy writes. Um, and actually he wrote a really important um, book about what global warming might look like a um, hundred years from now um, called, and I'm, it's another one that has numbers in the name, so I'm gonna butcher it. It's New York 2140 or something like that, 2120 maybe. Um, but uh, that one, that one's really good too. It's, it discusses what uh, lower Manhattan might look like if seas rose three meters, um, because most of lower Manhattan would then be underwater, but 
humans being humans, they wouldn't abandon it. He, he speculates that they would turn it into a Venice sort of situation where you just waterproof the buildings from the outside um, and then um, you know raise your entrance levels by a floor. Um, kind of kind of interesting. He talks globally what things might look like too a little bit. Stuff that's a little bit more relevant to what's going on uh, or in as far as our material goes here um, is uh, a good question about how do we determine the big, biggest resonance contributor. And I'm going to go back to this slide. This was uh, intro or this was the um, fourth lecture that had the our main um, criteria. Um, so the most important thing as we're figuring out is that we have as many filled octets as possible. If there's a way to fill all of the octets with one resonance structure and not with others, that's going to be the most significant resonance structure. Um, after that, if we, if all of the resonance structures we're contributing are um, all have the same number of filled octets, um, then the next most important thing is we keep the formal charges as close to zero as possible. Um, and then that being identical between two different resonance structures, you go to if we can put a negative formal charge on the more electronegative atom or a positive formal charge on the less electronegative atom. But again, that's less important than the first two criteria, which is fill as many valences as possible and keep your formal charges close to zero. Any, any other, uh, any questions on, on resonance contributors? If, I, if you have the resonance structures when it comes to ranking, which ones are most important? Is that seeming to make a little bit sense now? From what I remember from learning this the first time, I remember drawing the resonance structures correctly being a lot harder than ranking them once I had them. Um, but you guys know how I grade, how I grade tests. So if you draw your resonance structures incorrectly, but then rank them correctly according to these rules, I'm going to try to make sure on a test or a quiz, I only penalize you once for drawing the structures incorrectly. Um, so make sure you know those rules and then that'll take the sting out of missing a resonance structure here or there. I'll just rank the ones that you did get correct or the ones that you did draw. Um, so other questions about acidity. Um, because we had that question about uh, which acid is more, ac is more acidic and actually these, let's, I'm going to put this question on the next slide so we can look at that question while we're talking about it. Um, so this was a tricky question, right? Because there was a, there's some, um, acidity is kind of related to resonance as far as being able to figure out which one's going to be more acidic. Uh, and the, these two questions, why is an acid with, a, with more stable conjugate base, more acidic than an acid with a less stable conjugate base? That's related to the second, the third question here. What are the rules for determining acidity? Um, basically, and it, it comes down to the delta G for a reaction. If you if you have the energy of the of the reaction, you guys see that blue, or is it too light? Okay. Um, if we have delta G for the reaction, we should remember is a mixture of our enthalpy and entropy. That was our, our measure for whether or not something was, was spontaneous or not. If delta G was negative, the reaction was spontaneous. And then um, on the bottom, we usually just write it as reaction coordinate, which is how progressed is the reaction. Um, if, we, if we wind up looking at this, we have A reaction that's spontaneous, 
it's going downhill in energy. It's becoming more negative in delta G versus if we have the same reaction, the same started at the same point and it goes further downhill, that's going to be more spontaneous. So remember that these are our um, equilibrium constants are related to these delta G numbers. This equilibrium constant equals E to the negative delta G over RT. Do you guys remember that? It might not have been the first thing to come to mind when, when you heard this question. Um, but that means that more a more negative delta G, K is going to be bigger. If K is bigger, then equilibrium favors making that product more. So the number one reason why we care about how stable the product is, is because even assuming they're just as stable, everything's relatively close when it comes to where you're starting, as long as everything's got a full valence, that's probably going to be true. But something that where you can make a more stable product is going to be favored more highly at equilibrium. And so this goes to the second question is what are the rules for determinants determining acidity? Basically, if you want to know whether you're going to favor making product or not, it's always going to come back to this. So anything that you can look at, if you're comparing two molecules, anything that you can look at that either is going to make the um, starting material less stable or the conjugate base more stable is going to make that a more acidic compound. Because we're really looking at the difference between where you start and where you end. Um, so having, having protons on a more electronegative element is going to make things more acidic because they don't share those electrons as well with the H+. Um, if you can make additional resonance structures once you've deprotonated, that's going to make things more stable and therefore it's going to make that more acidic. If your resonance structures put a, a negative formal charge on a more electronegative element, that's going to make things more stable. And that's the one that wound up mattering for this problem, right? Because if we go back to, let me pull this up and I'll redraw these here. So basically more stable is more acidic. More stable favors making the product. And in the context of what we're talking about right now, if you're making your product more stable, that's going to mean it's more acidic. I didn't want to answer that, which is the point blank. Yes, because there are weak bases become more stable by adding protons to them frequently. So in that case, things become more basic if the protonated form is more stable. As opposed to things are more acidic if the deprotonated form is more stable. But it's always going to come back to what is that delta G? All right, so for this problem, um, if we look at the deprotonated forms, actually, let me make sure I draw them correctly because it's going to save us a few steps on drawing our resonance structures. So our first form, the one on the left, on the left on the quiz looked like this when it's deprotonated and our second looked almost identical except with the nitrogen one more spot away. <coughs> Excuse me. So for both of these, when we just look at them like this, it's not entirely obvious which one's going to be more stable once it's deprotonated. But if we look at what the different resonance structures are, so we're going to be able to move those. Remember, the first one of the first places to look at when you're drawing resonance structures is, is there a formal charge that I can spread out more? So in both of these cases, you've got a negative charge on the nitrogen, which you can basically move towards that ring. But you need to make room for it. So you have to move that pi bond over. So what this looks like after the resonance structure would be
you would wind up with a negative charge here, a double bond to the nitrogen, and then your other pi bonds stayed where they were for now. And then on the bottom one, it would look like um, we wind up with all of our all of our electrons moving to the same way, so we wind up looking like that. Let me get zoomed in a little bit so you can see it a little bit better. So between these two structures, when we're trying to decide our same criteria apply for determining which of these is more stable as our criteria for deciding which um, resonance structure is the biggest contributor. Because it's it comes down to the same thing, which one is the most stable, the most stable resonance structure is going to be the most um, significant contributor. And in this case, we're looking at these, they both have the same number of filled valences, they both have the same formal charge. Um, but the top example, you can put a negative charge on the on a nitrogen. And you can't hear if we went through this and did one more resonance structure, we'd find that that negative charge basically skips the nitrogen because we'd wind up drawing it um, with these electrons moving towards the nitrogen and these electrons stick to that carbon. And so we wind up with the negative charge basically skipping right over the nitrogen versus this form where we can put a negative charge on the nitrogen. So because it's, it's one, one atom away from that negative charge allows us to put the negative right on the nitrogen, which makes that the more acidic compound. That clear things up a little bit on that one, at least makes sense, even if you don't think that you could do it on your own. Yeah, that clears things up. I think I was following the wrong path of logic when I was thinking about that problem. I thought the bottom structure, you couldn't, you didn't have the option to have as much resonance as the top structure, but that wasn't the logic. The logic was, where's the negative charge? Right, they're both gonna have the same number of resonance structures. The only thing that's different is whether you put the negative on a carbon or on a nitrogen for that first resonance structure. Um, if we had something similar, if we added one more compound on here, where this nitrogen was an oxygen. So you had three choices. You could put a negative on an oxygen for your first resonance structure, negative on a nitrogen or negative on a carbon. Oxygen is the most electronegative, so that one would be even more favored if this nitrogen here was a oxygen. All right, let me go back to the slides here. And I think you guys all got this one right. It, it might help. Well, for some of you, it might help that it was multiple choice. Um, although you'd be surprised um, until I started looking into uh, data how much um, your your upbringing and how well you did in high school and middle school affects how well you understand how to take tests. Or maybe that's the other way around, how well you understand tests determines how well you, you do in middle school and high school. Um, and if you never got the hang of taking standardized tests, then multiple choice questions might not make a whole lot of sense to you inherently. Um, and that is something that can be learned. So if that's something that you struggle with, feel free to jump into office hours. I've got um, good tips for how to take multiple choice tests, especially in the sciences, but just in general too. If we're trying to look at this compound and we're trying to say which of these is not going to be a significant resonance structure. Um, if we're looking for something that's not a significant resonance structure, we're looking for something where that's gonna violate one of our rules. Um, once you guys get a little bit more practiced in, in OCAM and get a little bit more time into it, 
it's going to basically be, you might not be able to put your finger on it right away, but answering a question like this, which one of these just looks wrong? Um, for right now, you guys aren't quite there yet, but you, I think almost all of you managed to figure out that having a positive charge on a carbon that already has four bonds is not possible. So because, so this, this position right here has four bonds on it right now. It's got carbon with three carbon carbon bonds, one of which is a pi bond. And then it's got that hydrogen that's not explicitly drawn, um, which means that if you put a positive charge there and still had this pi bond, you either had to break the hydrogen off, which would actually make it a negative charge anyway, um, or it, you just can't have a formal charge of plus one with a carbon that has four bonds. If it's carbon that has four bonds, it has to be neutral. So in this case, not always the case, but in this case, C is the right answer. My father-in-law was always fond of yelling, yelling at my wife when she had, when he knew that she had a test, it's always C um, because that was his test taking strategy. Um, in this case, it winds up being true, but not always. So how are we feeling about naming or um, any of the quiz questions? The one that I didn't put on here yet, might as well talk about it now, since it kind of makes sense um, to do so is what do we do if we have a complicated branch is the way I'd, I like to describe these um, these alkanes when it comes to naming things that have a complicated branch and canvas is being slow to pull this up. Um, there we go. Um, while I'm working on this good news, um, Erina, our OCHEM tutor is starting today. Um, she, her hours for this first week are going to be Thursday, sorry, uh, Tuesday, Thursday from four to six, which doesn't do you guys a whole lot of good today since you're in lab. Um, but normally, um, it will, her hours will be two to four on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So you guys will have a little bit of time, an hour and a half um, to go see her before lab starts on Tuesdays um, or the whole time on Thursdays. Um, and that keeps it so she can also see my Gen Chem students that have lecture from one to three on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So I would go, if you were trying to avoid running into the Gen Chem students so that you can talk about OCHEM without having to um, share the tutor's time, I would recommend going before three when possible because my, my Gen Chem students are supposed to be in lecture with me then. And so you're less likely to run into them if you go from two to three. Um, and just a reminder of how to get there. If you go to LTCC's webpage uh, and go to um, the virtual campus tab, and there's an option for student support and scroll down until you find the library. Um, and one of the clicks, one of the links is tutoring. And when you click on that, it takes you to Cranium Cafe, which basically anybody who's currently working has a little online button and you can just um, jump into there. No nope, surprise, surprise, no tutors are tutoring at 8.30 in the morning. Um, and Erin is new, so her doesn't have her hours listed yet. She just got it fine, okay to start yesterday. So, um, but go down to the bottom and I think she should be set up today. And if not, then by Thursday. Um, and we'll got that all, all squared away now. All right, um, when it comes to the nomenclature, you guys mostly got these first two right. The trickiest thing was figuring out your longest carbon chain for this first one, right? Because it's not just left to right. If you start counting at the top and then wind your way around to the left, you can get eight in a row. So it was an octane. Um, and any of you guys, you guys now know what I mean about Canvas's auto grader sucks because you guys, many of you got the exact right answer, but if you put a space instead of a hyphen or a comma instead of a hyphen, um, you got marked with zero points on these. Um, 
So just remember that I'll go back and and adjust those going forward um, once I get get around to on Mondays get around to looking at them. Um, question three was the trickiest one though, right? That's the one, at least the one that we hadn't seen yet. Um, so if we wanted to look at question three and try to name it, our longest continuous carbon chain is going to start at the top. Actually, start on uh, this end would make the most sense as far as calling it carbon one. Keep our branches as low as possible in terms of their numbers. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Um, so it would be a heptane. And then the question is, what do we do with that branch that's more complicated? So if, we, if we're starting over here, our, most comp, our longest continuous carbon chain, it's there which means we've got a methyl group on carbon two. Then the question is, what do we do with this group over here? Um, and those of you who've had a little bit of OCHEM before or went, in, and went looking in the textbook, um, most, most of you tried to name that as a isopropyl group, which is the correct term for it. Um, but these, they're prefixes that used to be common and so when I say that they're a, it's the common name, I mean it in the sense that acetone is not the systematic name for acetone. It's just the common name for acetone. Um, and so an isopropyl group, iso means the same, like an isosceles triangle. So an isopropyl group is a branch, and we would usually break it up as, if you're writing it in, um, or typing it, you would write it as um, iso in cursive or italics, isopropyl group, um, or just write iso, and you don't have to put it in the, in the italics um, when you're just handwriting it. Um, iso means it's the same either direction. There are two different directions you could take that give you the, the, where it would be the same length to the end of the carbon chain and propyl because there's a total of three carbons there. I'm not a huge fan of this naming structure because as you get to anything bigger than a propyl group as your complicated branch, it relies on a lot of memorizing because there's, there's a difference between an isobutyl group and a secbutyl group where sec stands for secondary, which doesn't make any sense because in both cases it, you've got the, it's a secondary carbon that's attached. Um, and so, the way that I'm going to teach you to do this, and it's the new, the new school way of doing it, is to basically treat it as a branch within a branch. So, and what I mean by that is if we consider the longest continuous carbon chain that starts attached to the main group, our longest continuous carbon chain then is just two carbons which we'd normally name that as an ethyl group, right? If we're naming that as a branch. Um, but basically we're gonna use parentheses to, similar to the way we would in math to group things together. Um, and so we would call this an ethyl group. And we'd say that that ethyl group has a methyl attached. And we would just put it in parentheses. The parentheses are going to indicate that the methyl is applying to the ethyl group. And so you can do this with any complicated branch then once you get the hang of it. If you, if you, have, a, um, if you have something that looks a little bit different, you can use these parentheses to name it in a really, I don't want to reuse the word systematic, but that's what it is in a very systematic ordered, ordered way and not have to memorize the difference between an isobutyl group and a pro and a tert butyl group and a sec butyl group that all have four carbons attached to them. We'll just stick to the same naming structure and just use parentheses 
to indicate that this prefix applies to that prefix. Are you going to go like, so I was doing the isopropyl and the propyl and stuff. Um, are you going to go over that more? Well, I'll, I'll, I will show you those. And I thought that I had those slides in here today, but I was, as I was just sitting down and looking at forward, um, I don't think they're in here today. So at break, I'll grab those slides from wherever they are cool. and put them in and we'll talk about them. But this is going to be your more systematic way to do it. Anytime we come up there, sometimes where it's convenient, it's just easier to use the common name. Isopropyl shows up a lot of places. So that's the one that has the most um, common use still. But anything that's bigger than a propyl group attached like this, it's going to be easier to, to use these um, parentheses. And we can use, like in this instance, we could say isopropyl just because it's like a fast, easy thing to say. And yeah, it'd be good. And okay. So it's, yeah, it's like using the hybridization to describe a carbon. You, you know, you could say that it's what the geometry is, but it's usually easier to say sp3 than tetrahedral. Um, if one another example of doing this, if we had the same compound, except we had two methyls attached. This is what would normally be considered a butyl group because now there's four carbons in this branch. Um, and so that would be the common name for that would be a tert butyl group. Tert stands for tertiary because this carbon has three other carbons attached to it. Tertiary is the is the third example, if you think primary, secondary, tertiary is the third level of that. So a tertiary carbon has three other carbons attached to it. So this, the common name is a tert butyl group. You get butyl because there's four of them, tert because there are three attached to the central carbon. If we're just trying to use it with the parentheses, the systematic way of naming this, our longest continuous carbon chain that's attached to the main group is still just two carbons in a row, right? So in this case, if we have this complicated branch, we would name it as, in parentheses, it's going to be something ethyl group. And then using the parentheses to indicate that our next prefix is going to be attached to the ethyl, you've got one and two methyls attached to this. So that would be dimethyl ethyl. All right, so you see how you can build on that really easily. If this was three carbons long instead, it would be a propyl group that, where you could have parentheses. Um, and there will be some times where when you're counting your longest continuous carbon chain, depending on which way you count, you could get seven two different ways potentially. And if you're careful about which one you call your primary carbon chain, you don't have to do this necessarily. You can get rid of a complicated branch by just, so let's, if I redraw this and, if I added another carbon there, it was a heptane before, right? Because we get seven in a row. If now we can get seven in a row two different ways. So we can, in that case, we can pick the one that's more convenient. The other way we could count this would be one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then we don't have any complicated branches. We've got a lot of branches, but none of them are tricky. We've got three methyl groups and a propyl group, but none of them are complicated to where we would need to use the parentheses. So if you, if you do get a complicated branch that where you would need to use the parentheses, look to see if there's another way that you could count to the same number of carbons in a row, because it's possible there's just, a, there's an easier way to name it. They both would be correct. So let's actually name this one fully both ways. We'll start with the 
using the red um, as our primary group, like we've been doing. So we practice using the parentheses. And then we'll name it the other way as well. So if we're trying to name this where this is still our primary group, that would be heptane, right? Still seven carbons in a row. On carbon two, there's a methyl. And then on carbon four, one, two, three, four, we've got a big complicated branch. Now our big complicated branch is not just an ethyl, the longest continuous carbon chain that you can get that starts directly attached would be three in a row, right? One, two, three. So that would be a, it's gonna be a something propyl. In this case, what's attached to our branch is, again, two methyls. So dimethyl propyl. And that whole branch is attached to carbon four. So outside of the parentheses, you would say four open parentheses, dimethylpropyl, close parentheses, 2-methylheptane. Do you not have to put a 2 in front of the dimethyl? I'm really glad you mentioned that. We cool. do have to specify where these dimethyls are because they are, you could have a methyl group attached up here, right, on our branch. So inside the parentheses, we have to specify that this dimethyl propyl, they're both attached to, then we, this is considered carbon one of the branch. So we would say one, one dimethyl propyl in parentheses, four is on the outside of the parentheses saying that this whole branch is attached to carbon four. So John, you're, you're going off the D in dimethyl for, for the, for alphabetizing it in, instead of- I actually was not considering alphabetizing at all. I was naming the easy branch first and working from right to left. Um, so so would it be I'm, more I'm not gonna be picky about alphabetizing. It's oh. one of those things I'm not, I'm not gonna type in onto, the, onto Canvas every possible way to alphabetize it, um, but I'm not going to mark you down for, alphabet, for not alphabetizing these. Okay, ever? like. Ever. Like and not, not in my class at all. Okay. Um, and I would submit to you, it'd be a, a pretty weak excuse to grade someone down if they named everything right and then just misalphabetized. Um, I think it'd be really frustrating for you guys if, if you had a multiple choice test where they had the exact same name, just alphabetized differently. Um, I don't think that that would be a good test question in general. Um, and uh, I'd I will not ever mark you down for alphabetizing. Hey, Sean, I got, I got a question for that. Okay. Um, that, that dimethylpropyl group, um, with those, we won't ever think how before, like the, the parent chain can be flipped. So you're only going to have up to a certain, you know, like you'll never have, you know, at one point you'll end up uh, copying what you just did before. So with that, is, I think it's called like a substitute group in the book with that group would we worry about that flipping or no? Like at one point we'd be able to essentially flip that and we're going to get the, re the repeat again of that, correct? So that's what we're going to name next okay. because there are, there are, I think what you're saying, RJ, is that there, once we get a branch that's long enough, it's going to be, change what our longest <laughs> con carbon chain is, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's actually what we're going to name next because if, instead of following the red and considering the red your primary carbon group, if you went just from left to right here, that's also a heptane, okay. right? So 
and so in that case that's actually going to make our our branches a lot easier to name so if we consider if we just count from left to right wrong color That's also a heptane, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So like you were saying, once you get your branch big enough, that'll actually change what your, your main carbon group with is. If we named this one, if we named it this way, it's still going to be a heptane. But now instead of having this big complicated branch attached, we can we would have one, two, three methyls in different places. So we can actually name it a little bit easier because we can say trimethyl. Then we just have to specify where all three of them are. And it keeps our numbers a little bit lower. We get so we get three, three, four, and a six, or two, two, four, and five, five. So this one's kind of six, one. It's not that, you know, pick the one that keeps as many numbers as low as possible. Um, but I think that this one winds up being six and one, half a dozen, the other, um, so to speak. So if we just keep counting this as carbon one, since that's what we've been doing. We have a methyl on carbon two, and then we have two methyls on carbon five. So two, five, five, trimethyl. And then our other branch is one, two, three carbons long. So we would name it as four propyl. So four propyl two five five trimethyl heptane, or four open parentheses one one dimethyl propyl close parentheses two methyl heptane, are both valid names for the same molecule. This one's a little bit better when you can avoid using the parentheses just by picking a different main carbon group. You can't do it if it's not your longest continuous carbon chain, but if you have two choices for your longest continuous carbon chain, the one that makes your branches simple is usually the best one. Sean, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, isn't, uh, from what I remember, um, don't you want to keep the chains on the lowest numbers? So wouldn't the, the first one being two and four be preferred over two, four, or five, five? For, for this one? Yeah, wouldn't the, the, other the first way, one's lower numbers? If you counted the other way, we would get um, our dimethyls would, would be on carbon three. And so you get three, three, six. No, 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 no. I, I get that. I mean, so in the first one, we're, our chains are only on carbon two and four. And I th feel like that's lower than two, four, and five. Like with the second one, you're, you're including five, carbon five. Isn't that kind of then adding? Oh, like you're, you're going higher in order. Um, I see what you're saying. So because we can keep the two and four lower than all of these, the numbers here, um, that's a, that's a valid argument. Um, I, other than to say that usually we want to keep, even if it means we have more numbers or the numbers are higher, avoiding having a complicated branch is usually preferable. Right. Um, okay. Avoiding having to use these parentheses, even if it makes our numbers higher. Um, and we're going to, we're going to get to the case here as soon as we start introducing functional groups where that's not going to matter because it has to be the main carbon group has to have our functional groups on it. And so we're going to be a lot more limited in what we can consider our main carbon group at that point. And so we're going to have less options and be more limited that way, um, which seems weird, but adding more variables actually makes you more restricted if you use this system. Um, it actually, so it actually makes it easier. Um, there are less ways that you could count, basically.
Um, right. Yeah, I get that. So, and and I was just going going to go into. I would not mark either of these wrong either. Just like with the alphabetizing, if you use the parentheses properly, and they're both heptane, I'm not going to mark either of these wrong. I'm not going to say this way is right and that way is wrong because they both would get you to the right structure if you started from the name. That's the most important thing is that if you write both either of these correctly, there's no way I could draw the wrong molecule if I know the rules for naming things. And so that's the most important criteria for organic nomenclature is it's unambiguous. There's no way it could be misinterpreted to draw the wrong compound. Right, so as long as that's the case for your names, which again, you guys don't necessarily have the intuition yet to know whether you're doing it right, we'll get there. Um, but as long as there's no way I could misinterpret your name to draw the wrong compounds, that's at least really close to the right name, if not the, you know, just as equally valid. Okay. Yeah, thanks. I mean, there's a, so many ways to organize these things, so yeah. Right, right. Um, and so at this point, let's go ahead and take a break. We'll do some more complicated branches when we come back. I'll find those slides and we'll look at other types of um, complicated branches and practice using those parentheses and naming things. Um, and when we come back at nine, Did you have a good weekend, Sean? Uh, I was pretty good, busy. Got out all the Halloween decorations, which is always fun. <laughs> I like those Halloween decorations. I, Halloween's always been my wife's favorite holiday and uh, mine as well. So we have boxes of them. In fact, we, we didn't even get out any of the outdoor ones because we're supposed to get some weather this weekend, I think. Mm. But yeah, a lot of a lot of fun. Cool. How about you, Cody? Yeah, I had a great weekend. Put some new brakes on my lady's car and ate a bunch of pizza. And I tried out a really weird salad. Um, it was uh, the sauce for the salad was like a raspberry sauce, and it had like candied walnuts and salmon and stuff in there. I was kind of afraid to try it because it sounded so weird, but it was actually really good. Yeah, there's some sort of uh, some sort of rule for for chefs when they're when they're making salads that you can, it's like you need a a leafy green, a cheese, a fruit, and a nut. If you put all that together, it's almost always going to turn out good. A leafy green. What was the second thing? A cheese. A cheese. Uh. Nut fruit. and then what was it? Fruit. fruit. Okay, yeah. yeah. Nut, yeah. <laughs> so like almonds, almonds and ra and dried raspberries, or um, you know, walnuts and and cherries, or you know, as long as you get some cheese in there for a little fat. Um, yeah, I'm trying to remember what kind of cheese was in there. I that whether cheese was even on it or not is escaping my memory right now. <laughs> hey, what's up, man? What's up, Dashiell? How you doing, bud? You can have a snack. Sure, from that anything box. We'll get you started calling Dario in just a minute, okay? Hey, Sean. Yeah. Can I make the argument that I should get the half point for the purple one? Because I thought um, 
when I talked to you, you said you didn't catch the eye toe. So I just put, I could put purple. Yeah. Um, I will go back and there was a couple others. I'm just going to give everybody full credit for that. For okay. that one. Gotcha. Um, Thank you. Yeah, no worries. Remind me at the end of lecture because right now I'm just trying to track down those that slide I was talking about. Okay, we'll do. Did you make pizza, Cody? Uh, no, uh, we uh, they ordered pizza while I was working on the car. We got it from uh, Chicago Mike's down here in uh, Gardnerville, and. Uh, I think it had like bell peppers and sausage and pepperoni and probably a couple different kinds of cheese, but real thin, crispy, crunchy crust. It was a great pizza. That's my favorite style of pizza. Yeah, it's great. Have you ever tried that Chicago Mike's down here? No, I haven't. Is it good? Absolutely, man. It's a little on the pricey side, but you you might enjoy their pizza. I like it. Okay. Got yeah. some badass uh, baking, st baking steel, um, kind of right when lockdown started and it has been a game changer for pizza at home. Yeah, I use some kind of ceramic type of thing, but yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, same idea. I think um, the steel just holds a lot more heat than, than ceramic. Oh, you prefer the metal ones over the ceramic yeah, ones? Yeah, yeah, I've had a ceramic one and um, the baking steel is awesome. Maybe I'll try one. Yeah. Yeah, John, I, I have, a, well, it's not, a, baking steel per se, but it's, I use a, uh, cast iron and, a, Oh yeah. Yeah. Same idea. Yeah. And a, a, uh, a, uh, pizza stone just to yeah. see the difference. There, there's actually a pretty noticeable difference in the crust between the two. Yeah, I agree. And so I think it really depends on like which, what I'm trying to achieve. It, it's either or with the two of them. That's a great the idea. I've, I've got a cast iron pan laying around. Maybe I'll try that. Yeah. Yeah. Though. If you like the Chicago style that has the, um, the really thick, um, you know, bready fried dough crust. Um, I've seen take take cast iron pan and you and you put a bunch of butter in it and you put it in the oven with just the butter to bring it up to temperature and then you stick the dough oh, into okay. it when the butter's already you know oh, melted hmm. and sizzling. You got to be careful not to burn yourself, but that's yeah, how you okay. get that fried dough on the bottom oh. of a of a Chicago style pizza is cast iron. Yeah, it's really hot when you add the dough to it. I I have not tried that one, but it makes a lot of sense to me. I saw that. I did a pretty, uh, pretty gluttonous <laughs> during lockdown. <laughs> what, uh, what was it? A pizza or what was it? Was it just like every, it was deep dish? Thing? Yeah, it was deep dish. <laughs> great, great during the colder months. I'd say. <laughs> yeah, hey, I'm telling you, if, if, if there's ever, any, ever a chance to have a pizza party, if you guys ever want to make a hard <laughs> pizza party, I'm down. That's my stick right there. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I love it for um, having people over because. You just prep out the dough oh. and set out toppings and, you know, everyone can do their thing. That's yeah. a great idea. You get to like eat over, a, you know, a long time. You do like a pizza or two at a time and yeah. just hang out. Yeah. Have you seen those um, uni grills, those uni pizza ovens? Yeah. Like, is it like a kind of a gas powered, like it's stand alone? gas or wood. And they're yeah, like, right. yeah, yeah, I've, I've I mean, I wouldn't spend the money on that now, but at yeah. some point, I think it would be cool to have one of those. Yeah, totally. They, some of them are powerful. They can put out a ton of heat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One was like, the one I saw, the person put a laser on it, and it was like 920 degrees, and I was like, whoa. Dang. Yeah. Twice as my that's, oven. You know, like, that's so much. Jeez. Yeah, I think that's like the key to getting a really badass pizza is having, uh, you know, a ton of heat. And yeah, I agree. I totally agree. Masonry mass. Yeah. Yeah. Cody, so you live down in Gardnerville? Yeah, yeah, I'm down oh. here in Gardnerville. Oh, yeah. nice, nice, okay. For some reason, I thought you were up here. Like, I, yeah. Yeah, I did. Too. I was for a long time, but I've been down here for a little over a year now. You like it down there? I love it. Yeah, it's a little bit uh, 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 cheaper cost of living, so oh, yeah. it's a little bit easier yeah. for me down it here. It has everything. Anytime I leave here, I tend to go down that way anyway. Yeah, I really like it. It's like everything's within walking distance too. So if I have a few too many beers, I can just walk to the grocery store or whatever. <laughs> nice, 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 nice. You staying up at the lake these days, RJ? Yeah, I've been I've I've been here ever since I moved to Tahoe. I've been here the whole time. 
being from the East Coast and then moving here, I didn't really understand. Like, I I got that people kind of poked fun at Reno a little bit, <laughs> you know. And then, but then more as I live here more in Nevada and like Gardnerville area, even Reno. Sometimes I'm like, oh, I can see why people move there and live there. It, it, you're so close to everything here, yet you have everything over there. Yeah. Well, do you know what it was that drew you to Tahoe? Uh, it was the snow. I, it, it was, I graduated, I, I got my undergrad three months later, applied to every resort around the lake. Sierra was the only one that said yes. And then bought a one way ticket and moved and that was it. How cool, man. That takes a lot of courage to do something like that, especially by yourself. Yeah. 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 You know, like my college uh, interest was, I was trying to go to a college. I didn't know anyone. Wow. It was like close. And then then I was like, all right, I'll try a different city that I don't know anyone. And then, and then moved here. <laughs> I dig it, man. Very cool. Oh, yeah, no, it was, it was awesome. I chopped in the hip and it, it's worked out. So, Are you thinking you're uh, maybe going to up and go somewhere else new again? And For a program. For the right program, yes. I, I, cool, I, I man. That, but, other, you know, other than that, uh, you know, like everything I love keeps me here. So yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll ride that out until I find something else. Are you still working on gutters? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Still installing gutters. Um, that until essentially I find that program, pretty much. Nice, man. I'm going to be cleaning out gutters tomorrow. I was, I'm trying to figure out what I can stick down the downpipe to help knock those pine needles out. Um, where are you doing it? Uh, it's going to be in, in, off the ski run area on Aspen Drive. Okay. Um, do you have fish tape, electrical fish tape? exactly i have that yes that's what i was thinking about using yeah that and then maybe if you can if it's not low if it's not that low to the ground go from the top go from the top and snake it like up oh kind of try to pull this up and instead of up. pushing them down yeah because they tend to like jam at the top and like really at the top because i was thinking about using a hose to spray water in it at the same time i was using that fish tape to try to knock Lo those loosen some of it first and then okay it shoot it out yeah, yeah. cool man yeah. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. Is that uh, seasonal work? You do that stuff in the wintertime? It's supposed to be. It's supposed to be seasonal, but if there's enough room to put a ladder, I'll get up there. Which is <laughs> oh man, I like it. <laughs> <laughs> RJ, what part of uh, the East Coast are you from? Uh, I'm from Pittsburgh. Oh hell yeah. Yeah, I'm from Scranton. Oh, no way. Nice. Nice, nice, nice. When did you move up? I was going to ask you the same thing, RJ. I'm from New Hampshire, though. Oh, yeah. What, what part of New Hampshire? Um, basically Franconia. I don't know. Okay. Yeah, my, my school used to go up to New Hampshire in that area for their winter ski trips. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> cool. Where'd you go to college? I went to Ohio State. Wow. Okay. It's a long drive. To yeah. <laughs> yeah, I made it twice and was like, never going to do that again. <laughs> Party school. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, let's... Pennsylvania uh, is a long state, too. Yeah, it, you'd be surprised, too, uh, Wyoming. Wyoming's my least favorite state ever to drive through. I hate driving through Wyoming. It's <laughs> Wyoming always super hard. frozen and windy. <laughs> no. Oh, sorry, so the, I, along I-80. If you Mountains get off of I-80, Wyoming can be really nice. Have you driven um, through Teton Pass? The, I did not drive through Teton Pass. We drove around the Teton. Maybe I did. I don't know. We, no, we, Tetons are north of 80. You don't really go. I've, I've driven 80, a, a few different ways through Wyoming. I drove back from Red Lodge to South Lake, Red Lodge, Montana, through Wyoming and went through the middle of Wyoming, and but hit a couple passes along the way, um, too. So I'm, but I, and I've also driven through Wyoming to the entrance to Yellowstone that's in Wyoming. So I may have done the Teton Pass, but I don't know. We put so many miles on as my family because it's way cheaper to drive with four people that have to uh, cost a plane ticket than it is to fly these days. Um, although the, maybe that's all changing. Um, but yeah, that's Beartooth Pass. If you ever, if you ever, uh, Want, want a drive through a pass, Beartooth Pass between Idaho and Montana on the west hand side of Montana. 
um, is uh, the craziest mountain pass I've ever driven in. It just kept going up. It kept seeming like we're doing like the super steep climb and feel like oh, we have to be close to the top. We have to be close to the top. And then you turn, come around a bend and have another thousand feet to go. Um, and it, it uh, you're driving 30 miles an hour the whole way. We kept thinking, man, we're only like 100 miles away. We're going to make this really fast. And then that last 100 miles took us three and a half hours. Um, anyway, let's, uh, I wanted to show you guys what the common names would be for some of these complicated branches, just because you will see them in some places. Like I said, isopropyl is the most common, um, but there are a few different ways we can name these. And actually, I want to go back a slide. Um, so like we like we mentioned before, if you've got a an ethyl group with a methyl attached, the common name is isopropyl. And that's the, the easiest one to recognize and the easiest one to name. So that's what isopropyl is the most common of these common names. Um, you can arrange a butyl group though, so that it also has two equal paths you can take. Um, and so that would be an isobutyl group, it would look like this. Um, but these names start getting really, really complicated um, because if you start thinking all the different ways you can arrange things, um, you can have an N-propyl group. N for any of these common names, N means that it's just a straight chain. So we would just name an N-propyl group or an N-butyl group as just propyl or butyl. Um, a sec-butyl group, you wind up having four carbons in a row where you're attached to the middle carbon. So this would be a methyl propyl group. There's our propyl. And then it has a methyl attached to it. And then we did the example with a, a tert butyl group would be four carbons where all of the carbons are attached to that first carbon off the main group. Um, and so, yes, they're easier to or it's, it's easy to know what, uh, how to name these in some respects because all you're really looking for is how many carbons total are in the branch if you're name, using these naming systems. Um, but then the prefix in front of that, you still have to have a prefix on a prefix because you're either saying it's an N-butyl group, meaning four carbons in a row, or a sec-butyl group looks like this, or an isobutyl group looks like this. So. And so this would be one, two, three, four carbons. So it would be a butyl group. If you're using that old school naming system, it would still be a butyl group. Um, but I find this system to be a lot more confusing than just learning how to use the parentheses and using the same system with the prefixes. It's just a prefix on a prefix is what you're indicating with the, with the um, parentheses. So let's try a few more of those. And we'll try the other way where I give you the name and you draw it. Right, so for each of these, the one on the right, I made it really easy to find the longest carbon chains just all in a row. And when you're drawing these structures out, if you're going from the name to the structure, there's never anything wrong with just making the longest carbon chain just go straight left to right. That's the, the logical way to do it. Um, I only do it other way when either it doesn't occur to me to draw it a certain way or if I don't have the name ahead of time 
and I'm trying to, to draw a, structure, a certain structure, I might wind up with it not like that. Or if I'm trying to test whether or not you guys can find the longest carbon chain um, are usually the reasons why I draw it as, as a convoluted structure. Um, so for this one on the left, got a total of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight carbons in a row. Don't forget to, that you have a carbon at the end of this group here. Easy to forget that that's a carbon too. So eight in a row, so octane. And on carbon one, two, three, four, we have this propyl, this propyl group. So we could either name it as isopropyl, four isopropyl, octane or four methyl ethyl in parentheses octane again isopropyl is common enough that that um you guys will learn to recognize those pretty easily and it might be easier to just do this it's a few letters shorter but this is the more universal way to do it with the parentheses that are indicating that that methyl, sorry, I didn't unshare. So indicate the parentheses indicating that the methyl is attached to the ethyl. Um, I, maybe I missed it. Could you just reiterate why we wouldn't put that there's two methyl groups, why we wouldn't put like dimethyl or four so, parentheses two methyl? Yes. Um, let me, I guess I'll, uh, I'll use the board on this one. So if we have our eight in a row, one, two, three, four, five, and on carbon four, we have this isopropyl group. It's, we wouldn't call them both methyls because if we're starting from, from right here, that's where our branch starts. We have two carbons in a row is our longest part of the branch. Right. There's a carbon, there's a carbon. So it's an ethyl group that has a methyl attached. Okay. It, okay. It, we wouldn't name it as a dimethyl methyl group. You could think about it as if this, if you consider this to be a methyl, then you would have two methyls attached to a methyl, mm -hmm. but that's not your longest continuous chain that's part of the branch. Okay, thank you. It's so early. I get that. I get that. I was, I finished grading your guys' quizzes and uploading the slide. I did upload the slides, didn't I? Anybody look today? Okay. I didn't finish that till around midnight last night, so I'm feeling it as well. Um, if we're looking at the other one here, on, let me go back to the slides. We count the number of carbons in a row. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And prefix for nine is known, N-O-N. So our structure would be, for this one would be, let me just put a text box and we'll just do this one that way. Would be known. And if we wanted to, um, if we wanted to indicate that we had this prefix, this is a a sec butyl group. If we we're using the old school of naming, so you could say sec butyl. You don't want it capitalized, and ideally, you would have it italicized um, if you were typing. Um, the other way of naming this would then be we have a propyl group one two three attached to our main carbon group to our nonane that has a methyl attached as well so this would be in parentheses oh, nice. i forgot the number on this one that'd be one two three four five five 
sec butyl no name or five methyl propyl no name no parentheses there you mind if i ask you a question um one second let me the other thing to consider here and maybe this this might address your question is if there's more than one place you could put a methyl on our branch we do specify where it's attached so more specifically than just leaving it there we would say it's one methylpropyl if it was an isobutyl group that had that your branch coming off up here it would be two methylpropyl all right cody what's up i was just going to ask the sequence if it if if you're if you feel strongly whether or not the methyl is supposed to go in front of the propyl inside of the parentheses so yes i do in this case because the methyl is applied to the propyl a prefix always applies to what's after it so you wouldn't say that you've got a propyl group on a methyl group you would say you have a methyl group on a propyl group because the propyl is longer so it's kind of like you have a methyl on a propyl on a known name like you go if you're going left to right it's like your first little dinky guy and then like your next big one and then your big big one right and that's why a lot of times it helps to write from the right left start with what the biggest thing is and then it and it can be really helpful while you guys are getting used to this too to actually draw the circles like i am because it makes it really obvious when something's sticking off of that main group and anytime you've got something that breaks that circle you have to indicate it with a with a prefix of some sort No name is a weird one, especially in is it the last couple of years. There's there's that female rapper from I think she's from Chicago. No name, um, and every, and she doesn't capitalize it, and so it's just no name. And it sound every time I read it, I think no name, because I learned chemistry before um, I've heard of her. So now you will think about chemistry as well when you see her name. She um, chemistry. Any any other questions on the, these first two? And I generally find it easier to go from the from the name to the structure because there are fewer rules. If you remember what the rules mean when you see them, you don't actually have to remember them coming off the top of your head. If that makes any sense, you can use use the name to remind you what the rules are. Think about, okay, why did they put the two inside the parentheses or what do the parentheses mean as opposed to having to remember to use parentheses in the first place. Um, so I always found that to be a little bit easier. Plus, you can just go left to right. You don't have to think about, you know, making funny shapes with it or counting from, you know, in some strange way. It's already defined for you. And if we wanted to name these. Let me just pull up mold view um, is frequently a helpful way to name these if we're not in person with a whiteboard. If we wanted to name this, we start by doing seven carbons in a row. Boom, there's our, our heptane. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Attached to the heptane on carbon two is a methyl group. On carbon four, one, two, three, four, is a methyl ethyl group. Um, I don't know why I didn't put the hyphens there. Or an isopropyl group. Methyl ethyl and isopropyl mean the same thing. All right, so this applies to tests as well. Um, more test taking strategy tips is um i frequently will will go um go back use a test question to jog my memory on how to name things like if you did this in this order if, if i had the test set up to where it was okay name these structures and then immediately after that draw the structures for these names um 
it's never a bad idea to, after you look at the names that I give you, go back and look at the names you wrote and make sure you followed all the same rules that I did. Use it to remind yourself um, of, of what the rules are for, for nomenclature. Um, it's not always going to be helpful, but sometimes it will be. Smells like fall. My heater kicked on. All right. Last but not least, we have a decane. So that's 10 in a row. It's nine. There's 10. And we only have one branch here. It's on carbon four. So one, two, three, four. I'm actually going to count from the other side just so I can draw the branch facing downward so I won't run into the other structure I just drew. One, two, three, four. And it's a propyl group. One, two, three. And on the second carbon of the propyl group, it has a methyl attached. So our, there's our decane minus that bottom piece. There's our decane. Here's our propyl group. And on the second carbon of that propyl group, we don't have it when you have a branch that you're numbering, you don't have a choice with where you start counting. You always have to start counting from where it's attached. So this is carbon one. That means we've got a methyl group on the second carbon of the propyl group. Which, and then the common name for that type of group for a two methyl propyl group would be a isobutyl group. But again, knowing how to use these parentheses is going to be more consistently helpful um, because then you can apply it to anything because we didn't even cover pentyl groups, groups with five carbons on them, right? I didn't show you what a sec pentyl group versus an n pentyl versus an isopentyl, any of that. I didn't even get into that, but you don't even need to know what those look like because if you know how to use the parentheses, you can handle that. Would that be sec butyl? This, this one would be an isobutyl. Sec butyl would look like this. An n butyl would just be a straight chain that was four carbons long. All right, so takes getting used to. I know that. That's why we're spending so much time on it today. Um, and it's just more practice for how to use these prefixes, which is most of what we're going to add at this point. Because if you can get the hang of naming the main carbon structures, everything else we're going to do in terms of nomenclature is just going to be adding either more prefixes or more, more suffixes to indicate various functional groups. Right, but it's all going to be based around the same structure of find your longest carbon chain, name all the branches. Any other questions on these ones? All right. Not for now anyway, right? Um, halogens, we also indicate with a prefix. And the nice thing about halogens is they can't be complicated. Halogens only have one vacant spot. Remember, halogens are over in column 17 on the periodic table. So they only have one vacant spot. They only, to have a formal charge of zero, they're only going to have make one bond. So basically, in terms of molecular formulas, um, for the halogens, you're basically going to pull a hydrogen off and replace it with a halogen is what this would look like. So you're going to be one hydrogen short of what you normally would have and just you're replacing it with a chlorine or a bromine or an iodine or a fluorine. Um, and we just use, use prefixes just like with any other branch, with, just like with a, a carbon branch, we still just use prefixes here um, to indicate these. So a chlorine group, we say it's a chloro. Bromine is bromo. 
two chlorines is dichloro. Fluorine is fluoro. Iodine looks the weirdest and sounds the weirdest, iodo. I-O-D-O is the prefix for fluorine. Right, and so just the same rules as, as we've been doing. Find your longest carbon chain, name your branches, including halogens with a prefix and a number. Right, so for this first one, our longest continuous carbon chain. This is getting into what I was, what I mentioned before is the longest carbon chain that has the halogen attached. So we, it limits what we can consider our longest carbon chain in some ways. But if that's our longest continuous carbon chain, one, two, three, four, five, six, it's gonna be a hexane. And then that hexane has a methyl attached on carbon three. And then it also has a chlorine attached on carbon two. So two chloro, three methyl hexane. Right, so adding more vocab essentially, but it's really just more of the same. And so what would this second one be? It's our longest continuous carbon chain. Five, I think. Six. I think it's six. One, two, three. It's got all, it's got five sides of a hexagon, but remember we're counting the the vertices, the points at the end of the lines, not the lines themselves. So it's another hexane. It's another methyl hexane. And in this case, we get a couple different options for where we could um, put the, yeah, my computer's being funny here. Um, where we could put the numbers, we could consider this 2-methyl-5-bromo hexane, or we could flip the two numbers that get the same numbers either way, right? But in general, it's going to be a, a recurring rule here. Whatever is not an alkane, whatever is not just carbon hydrogen single bonds is usually going to have priority. We care more about whatever is not just carbons and hydrogen single bonds. So if we're choosing which way to count and we could keep the numbers as low as it's either two, five, either way, we're usually gonna put the bromo as two and put the methyl as five. And then if we were being really, really picky and wanted to alphabetize, we'd put two bromo first. But again, I'm not, I'm never gonna mark you down for that. So what would these others look like? That'd be dichloro. Ethane it would be dichloroethane. Do we need to specify numbers on that dichloro? Uh, yes, because they could both be on the same yeah. carbon, right? Exactly. So, if it was a, if we we're talking about carbon branches, we wouldn't need to specify because a lot of times when they're this small, there's only one way you could attach them. But we could have both chlorines attached to the same carbon on ethane. You could have one one dichloroethane, or in this case, we have one two dichloroethane. That one, I'm super confused by. Like, okay. that doesn't make sense to me. <laughs> Let me type it in. So, is there anything specifically that, that looks off to you? I 
I mean, hold on. So, oh, whatever you just typed got caught. Okay, there we go. Um, so it's an ethane because that center is technically two carbons? Correct. Okay, so that's like the longest chain. The longest chain is only two carbons long. Okay. Despite the fact we had to draw three lines, it looks like a butyl group, like a butane, because we had to draw three lines. Yeah. But that's not a carbon here. That's a chlorine. And same over here. So it's only two carbons. Okay. okay. Yeah. That makes more sense. Thanks. No problem. Um, the skeletal structure for the really simple ones winds up looking really funny sometimes. The skeletal structure for dichloromethane is even funnier looking. Dichloromethane is a really common solvent that we use all the time. Um, and the skeletal structure is just, so the carbon would just be a single point for a skeletal structure for methane, which just you can't draw a skeletal structure for methane. But dichloromethane is that. And this is why when we get to the really small molecules, we frequently won't do the skeletal structure. It's actually less confusing to write it out as the condensed form. Because the condensed form for dichloromethane would be CH2Cl2, which that makes a lot more sense to look at than this does. Um, and so that's that's why we still have both condensed and skeletal structure. It seems like you only need one of the two, but that's not easy to look at and actually understand what's going on. And plus, if it's that easy to type a, stru a condensed structure, why would you go to the trouble of adding a figure in your paper when you can just type it in text? But it, as soon as you get much larger than two carbons, it becomes easier to um, to use the skeletal structure. All right. This last one I'll leave for now. I'll, I won't walk through it, but it's going to be three carbons in a row. I say I won't walk through it and we'll leave it for now and then I start walking through it. Um, three carbons in a row, and we want to pick them so that our fluorine is on that main carbon group. Like this is another one where there, we, there are two ways we could count to three carbons in a row. We want to pick the one that has the fluorine attached. So this would be one fluoro methyl propane. Would you have to have the one there? For the fluoro, yes. You don't need to say where the methyl group is because if it's propane, there's only one place you could put a methyl. Uh -huh. But you do need the number on the fluorine because you could attach the fluorine to the middle carbon. Ah. If you're ever unsure if you, if you need the numbers, try changing the number and seeing if you get the same molecule back. Or if it's if you have the same parent group and if you get the same molecule back, or if it's not possible to draw that with a different number, then, then you didn't need the number. But if there's cool. ever a two, more than one way to arrange it, you need the number. And as I will continue to reiterate, um, it's better to be more specific, overly specific, and be redundant than it is to miss a number that you need. Cool, thanks. Um, lots more practice with these using condensed structure, which is a little bit harder to track your longest carbon chains. Um, and I will leave that for you guys for now. Because I want to talk about cyclo groups. Cyclo is just another prefix. So like adding halogens with the prefix, cyclo just means that whatever, your, whatever comes after cyclo is in a ring. So if you have six carbons in a ring structure, that's a hexane, and to indicate that, they're, that both ends of the hexane are attached together, we just put cyclo in front, cyclohexane. 
And the most common ones that you're going to see are cyclohexane and cyclopentane. They're the most stable ring structures. And we'll talk about why that is a little bit um, on, I think we get into that starting on uh, Thursday. Um, but that's, it's just one more prefix that you can use to describe things. And if the cyclo group is the longest carbon chain, you name is normal. The trick with this with the cyclo groups is when you're looking for your longest carbon chain, you can't go into the ring from it or leave the ring. It's either the ring or it's what the ring is attached to. We wouldn't this there are seven carbons here, and you could argue that that's seven carbons in a one long chain, right? If we have this five-sided ring with two carbons hanging off, you could draw a circle that kind of looked like that, right? Where you could say, oh, that's seven carbons in a row. We don't count into rings or out of rings. When you're looking for your longest continuous carbon chain, it's either the ring or it's what the ring's attached to, but it's not both. So in this case, we have the choice of five carbons in a, in a ring with an ethyl group attached. Um, and so the five carbons in a ring is our longest continuous carbon chain. And so we would, if it was five carbons in a row, we would name it pentane. And the fact that they're in a ring, we just add cyclo in front, cyclopentane. And then we have a, a branch attached. So we'd name the branch ethyl cyclopentane. Do we need a number on in front of ethyl? Because wherever we're attaching it, that could be carbon one, right? Or if I drew the ethyl over, let's see how well I can draw a pentagon with my mouse. Ah, I've drawn worse. Um, if I drew the ethyl over here, that's this molecule just spun less than 60 degrees to the right. Oh, sorry, a little more than 60 degrees to the right. Right, so we don't need to say one ethyl cyclopentane because whatever carbon it's attached to, whatever is going to be carbon one. If you had two groups attached, then we do need to specify because we're, we're, we're really going to specify is where are they relative to each other. So in this case, we could say one methyl, two ethyl, or we could flip the numbers, doesn't matter. Right? And it's... So let's continue on because nomenclature is, we're spending a lot of time on it looking for all of the different ways we can do these things um, because it's important we get the fundamentals down. Valence is saying hi to everybody. Um, you can sit in the chair over here if you want. Um, yes, yeah, sit there though, stay there. Because I need to use the whiteboard. Um, but once we get through this, it's going to make the rest of it go faster because we won't need to spend as much time on nomenclature. And if you want a, if you're getting good at drawing pentagons and hexagons, if you want to give yourself a challenge, try drawing a nice even heptagon. Heptagons are really tricky to draw accurately for whatever reason, like octagons, hexagons, pentagons, you can draw those pretty easily. A seven-sided ring is really hard to draw by hand. Um, I usually wind up making four of them look like it's an octagon and making the other half look like a hexagon and just connecting the two sides. Um, but there's no difference about naming if we if this is our longest continuous carbon chain is seven in a row, we're going to name that as cy cycloheptane. And then we're just going to add, um, add prefixes to indicate where everything's attached. So we've got three different, three different branches. Um, but there's nothing inherently tricky about that. Valence, close the door, please. So seven 
in a row, cycloheptane, a fluoro group, a chloro group, and a propyl group. So we would name it as 1-fluoro-1-chloro-1-2-3-propyl-1-2-3-propyl-1-2-3-propyl-1-2-3-propyl-1-2-3-propyl-1-2-3-propyl-1-2-3-propyl-1-2-3-propyl-1-2-3-prop
sitting on top of, of the um, water. So, you know, something like that. And it's actually, which it's actually kind of cool, the iridescent rainbowy colors you're seeing are, you're actually looking at um, distinct numbers, integer numbers of molecules sitting on top of the water. When it's, when it's more thick, it refracts the light differently than when it's only one or two molecules thick, which is why you get that rainbow sheen. If, if you take gas or any sort of hydrocarbon and spread it out evenly, so it's all one molecule thick, you basically can't see it. It might look a little bit oily, um, but it's not going to have that rainbow color. Um, and that's one of the reasons why oil spills are such a big deal in the, in the ocean is because they will literally spread so that they are one molecule thick, which means a small amount of oil can cover the entire Gulf of Mexico um, because it doesn't take very many molecules to, if you're spreading them one molecule thick, um, you can cover the entire area pretty well. And why doesn't it kind of self-level like that sometimes? Um, so it, it generally will if you give it enough time. It all pretty much always will if you give it enough time, which is why they try to contain oil spills quickly. Because if you can do something as simple as putting, put floating foam buoys around the area, that's going to be enough to prevent most of the oil from making it over the little bits of rope and foam because that just that little half inch above the water level is enough to contain most of it. Um, but once you get it all the way spread out, there's not much you can do. Um, other, I mean, there, are, there are some things you can do and it's kind of like you can use a sponge that's hydrophobic that won't interact with the water to soak up some of it, but it's, you basically have to cover the entire area to, to skim that stuff off. Um, so that's, that's one of the reasons why they have oil spills have such a far, far reaching effect, um, is because gravity pulls them flat. Um, when it comes to boiling points, if they're all nonpolar, the only inter intermolecular forces we have between nonpolar molecules is what, does anybody remember the name of that other type of interactions? Uh, London dispersion? Dispersion yeah. forces, yeah. Or induced dipole, or there's van der Waals forces even sometimes referred to it that way. Basically, those were the ones where you could have a temporary dipole when you just have, because there's some possibility, finite possibility, finding more of the electrons on one side of the molecule than the other for a split second. Um, and so there's always some attractive force between these molecules, even if they're nonpolar. And the main thing that's going to determine how strong those last forces are is going to be how many electrons you have. The more electrons you have, the greater the possibility of, of finding more of them on one side than the other. And the lucky thing is we don't actually have to count the electrons to be able to do this because if we're talking about carbon hydrocarbons, all we really need to do is look at what molecules are bigger. Higher atomic mass or higher molecular weight is pretty much always going to mean more electrons as well if it's a neutral molecule, right? So if it's nonpolar, the number one thing we're looking at to determine boiling point is going to be which one's bigger. Um, so methane versus ethane, ethane is going to have a slightly higher boiling point. It's still going to be less than zero Celsius for these two because they're both really small. Butane and propane, you're starting to get a little bit more. You can actually have propane as a liquid above zero Fahrenheit, I think, but not much above it, um, which is why you always keep it pressurized in the canisters. Um, and butane's boiling point is between zero Fahrenheit and zero Celsius, I believe, um, which is why cigarette lighters don't work as well when it's cold out, because you need the butane to be in gas form in order for it to burn, make a convenient flame. And so you can have a cigarette lighter that's totally filled with butane that won't light if it's cold enough out. Um, usually in that case, if you just warm it up with your hand, that's enough to get the, everything moving again. Um, 
talked about this a little bit already. One of the things that is interesting though about these is despite the fact they're all carbons and hydrogens and they can even have the same molecular formula. So in this case, these, this is carbon, this is octane and a tetramethyl butane. Um, they're gonna have the exact same formula. They're both gonna be C8H18. But when you burn them, you don't get the same amount of energy out of both of them, which is weird. That doesn't seem like it should make sense, right? They've got the same molecular formula, therefore why, they've even got the same number of carbon-carbon bonds and carbon-hydrogen bonds. So why is it that you wind up with octane having a, is being more exothermic to burn than this tetramethyl butane? Clearly there must be something else going on, right? John, did you have an idea? Uh, does it take more energy to break those dispersion forces? That's, that's exactly the right sort of approach to thinking about this. What other things are there that could be interacting here? Um, and that could be playing a role with, with this one. Most of what we're going to see where we're going to this. Um, and so here's, here's also what the difference is. If you go from having octane to dimethylhexane to tetramethyl butane, we keep losing energy as far as how exothermic they are. And essentially it's, it has to do with the fact that these methyl groups will basically push on each other. So it's, it's less, the, the dispersion forces also play a role. Um, in fact, that's gonna affect the boiling point of these different compounds as well. But the main thing is actually going to is going to be what we call sterics, um, and sterics are spelled S T E R I C. So steric forces are just the forces that you have when you have these large groups, like a methyl group right, all attached to the same carbon, they're physically going to not have enough room to spread out as much as they want. They're going to push on each other, which makes them a little bit less stable. Having a nice long carbon chain, everything's as far apart from each other as it can be. But when you start forcing these things to be closer and closer together, then it, you wind up actually with them being a little bit less stable. Um, and that's why they, they can have similar boiling points and still not be quite the same amount of energy, um, which is why we rate gasoline in terms of octane levels. Um, and so here's a bunch of different um, bunch of different uses. This is basically what happens with uh, crude petroleum is you take it, which is basically almost all alkanes once they do a little bit of filtration on it. Um, and basically, you'll notice that anything that boils between about 20 Celsius to 200 Celsius, it, they put it into gasoline. And that's going to be a mixture of a whole bunch of different alkane compounds. And so that's actually why we have an octane rating on gasoline is higher octane rating. It's basically the percentage Rel of energy you can get out of it relative to just burning pure octane. If you're if you burn pure octane, that's a straight chain. We call that 100%. And so 91 octane fuel means it's got 91% the energy of burning pure octane. Um, and because it's really rather than try to separate out all these different isomers that have very similar properties to each other we just basically mix them together. The way they separate and refine petroleum is you set up a distillation. They have it set up as a fractional distillation, which is what we're gonna talk about in lab today. Um, and then they have it set up so they can actually collect um, their sample at 10 different heights along this, this um, condenser. And 
whatever condenses at the highest temperature, that's whatever has the lowest boiling point. And so that, that's where they would, anything that comes out the top is going to be natural gas and they usually will just burn that rather than even trying to contain it because it's easier. Um, and it's not worth that much anyway. Anything that condenses right below that is they use for a solvent um, or butane or propane. Anything that can, below that is gasoline. Anything condensed below that, you get into jet fuel. And the larger these molecules get, the more energy they have in those carbon, carbon, and carbon hydrogen bonds. So you wind up with things that are more useful, more energy dense, so, which is one reason why diesel gets better mileage than gasoline, is diesel is a lot higher boiling point. It's a lot bigger molecules than gasoline. So would we get better gas mileage if we filled our car with a higher octane gas? Yes, you do. Um, there's a point of diminishing return um, where it's some of it is going to go into just keeping the car running. But in general, yeah, if you run, if you put better gasoline in your car or higher octane gasoline in your car, it will go farther. Um, and it will also typically run cleaner as well because the same volume that has a higher octane means it's got less other stuff mixed in, generally speaking. Um, that doesn't mean I always fill my car with gasoline. I, you can actually measure this. Next time you do a road trip, fill your car when you're gonna getting ready to go on a big long flat part like when you get through the rockies and you're going to be going the same direction the same same level for a long time do a gas i fill up a gas tank with regular and then the next state fill up with premium and calculate your get your mileage both times and you'll you'll notice a difference a couple miles per gallon maybe probably not worth the price that you pay for it in general sean i've actually I've actually been experimenting that with that for like the past five months on my own with yeah. it straight, like the lowest grade at Costco. And then I've been doing the past three months with the highest grade. And it's like a three mile per hour difference within the first month or mile per gallon difference nice. within the first month that, that it, I, I saw it like go back and forth. Nice. And the, the other thing that is another variable that can, that can throw you off on that. And uh, if you're getting it all from the same place, that helps. Um, but if you fill up at different brands, um, that can actually change things. Um, a friend of mine used to work for Chevron and he worked in the, in the, um, in the lab that developed the additives that they put in the Tecron that they Chevron with Tecron. Um, he worked in the lab that developed Tecron and tweaked the formula. Um, and they actually, those, those studies that they put on the commercials where it shows your, your um, engine looking all gunky and then, but if you use Tecron, it magically makes it all better. It said that that's actually pretty accurate, but you only need to fill up with, with something like that about every third gas tank or so. We'll keep your engine looking a lot uh, healthier. Um, and he was, he was selling me on Chevron a little bit, but Chevron actually puts that stuff in all of their levels versus if you go to Shell, not only is Shell more expensive, but Shell only puts their additive that does the same thing, but it's only in the premium stuff. So I, I generally fill up at Chevron every third gas tank or so when I'm thinking about it or when it's convenient just to uh, help out with that. But anyway, we're five minutes over. We'll end here and we will have lab today and Today's lab, I'm going to give you a, a procedure and we'll talk a little bit about the techniques and then I'm gonna give you made up data and then you guys are gonna play with Excel and plot stuff and calculate stuff. Um, so more than just read this page and answer questions about it, it's a little bit more in depth than that. Um, so I will see everybody at 3.30.